So the topic for today for the Cribble Office Hours is about GitOps. Uh, basically, how Cribble see and recommend um, customer that are in Cribble Dev environment to move to a Cribble production environment. And uh, kind of from a high level point of view, the kind of the main reason that Cribble decided, the, the company decided to leverage Git, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket for, um, to, to enable customers to move from uh, development to production is because um, this, this product, this GitOps products have a truly a phenomenal a framework that uh, really takes into consideration DevOps best practices. It's a, the ability to have version control. We had that integration for quite a while now. Um, collaboration, in other words, uh, compliance, um, uh, basically along the lines of you commit something or you send some configurations from the left side of this uh, UI to Git, and Git can say, I'm going to accept that piece of configuration or not. And the whole notion of a C CI, CD kind of methodology, and then only once it was approved, you can send the data to to, to Cribble production or to some other destination. All of that is the main reason we used GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab as that piece of integration. The point is that we do have customers right now that can take configuration from Cribble and do R6, R6 or put the data into S3 and then basically uh, rehydrate Cribble purely based on any repository. It does not have to be a GitOps integration. What GitOps gives us is all of those um, compliance and approval that is not necessarily available through any other mechanism. So that's kind of the, why are we using GitOps to do, um, to move Cribble from development uh, environment to a production environment. And kind of from a, again, this is a high level, whenever we talk about that, and I'll go through these five steps. Um, so this UI here, that's gonna be Cribble development. It's a whole installation of Cribble. There was little node, a bunch of workers. The one on the right here, supposed to represent a Cribble production environment. Again, it could be um, a whole, most likely it's gonna be a whole set of installation of Cribble worker nodes, Cribble leader node, a standalone basically. And then as we look at through um, the flow that we're gonna cover, and by the way, this UI here is the UI of GitOps is the integration point. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the steps of um, we change the Cribble um, configuration in one place. We will then in the demo and also in the slide, we're gonna show uh, us committing the changes to the remote repository. In other words, it's not just the local uh, Git repository, but it's also the remote. From there, we will uh, do the steps where whenever you are ready, you will change, you basically commit and merge the uh, Cribble um, configuration from one branch to another branch in GitOps. Uh, that's kind of step three and four. And then step five is where Cribble um, leader node on the production then synchronize the data from GitOps to the leader node. So that's kind of the, the loop that I'm gonna go through on the slides. And with, and also in the demo, by the way. And so with that, let me just uh, kind of dive into the details a little bit. The very first step is to, when you configure this, is to do a few things. Number one, we have to tell the Cribble development 
environment to um, to talk to GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and to talk to a branch. A branch, most likely in my case, in my demo, I called it the dev branch. Also, another piece that uh, to set it up is that you have to tell Cribble to then point the leader node, the production, to the production branch. And the last piece here, and again, could be best practice, could be just a, a feature, is to turn the Cribble production environment to a read-only. In other words, you should not enable the end user to do any modification on your production environment that will change the production branch. In other words, it will be one-way communication. And to do this, in Cribble, in the in under settings, we have this option or under a Git, and in there under Git settings, and it's you click on remote, and you in this particular demo, I'm just showing how what I had to do to set it up. And my in my case, I use the SSH authentication, and the private key goes to Cribble, the public key goes to Git, uh, to GitLab. Uh, sorry, to GitHub in my case. Uh, so that's step one. Step two is I told Cribble which branch I want to use. In the case of my production, I pointed to the production branch of, uh, uh, of my uh, 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 repository. And finally, the last step, um, once you click on the, the branch and once you picked it up, there is one more flag you have to set up uh, specifically for production, and that is, it's called GitOps workflow. It's called push. Uh, if you set it up to push, you turn Cribble to a read-only mode. So what, that's what I had to do on my production, on my dev. This particular uh, flag is set to none, which means dev can do a, a can send updates to uh, to GitHub. So that's really step one, just configuring the basics. Step two in this ecosystem is you go in and you add, um, you add a route, you add a pipeline, you add uh, some pack into your development environment and you can see that Cribble is smart enough when you click on a setting changes and you're about to do git push, it tells you which branch it's going to go to. So once that is set up, once you click on Git Push, Cribble will then send the data to that particular branch um, in, uh, in GitHub. And the next two steps, step three and step four, has nothing to do with Cribble in an essence. It's all done inside of Bitbucket, GitLab, uh, GitHub. And that is, once you did, once you ask Cribble to push those changes to the remote repository, to the dev branch, the next part is all done in GitHub. You will see this option to do compare and pull requests. You will see this option to maybe approve that request. Uh, you will see this option, again, once everything was merged, you will see a message that says one uh, commit was went to the production branch from the dev branch. And then finally, if all goes well and you have this lovely um, flag that, sh that shows everything is good, you will see the changes that you saw initially only in the dev branch now is available also in the production branch. Now, a really important part is that all of that stuff, even though that information, the latest configuration is in the production branch of your Git, you still, under production, under the Cribble production instance, still have the old settings. In other words, they still, we still have not merged or collected that configuration into the Cribble production environment. So just be aware, you can make as many changes as you want in dev. You can keep on changing those 
and keep on adding those uh, configuration to your production branch. But until you go to step five, which is the step in which we uh, tell the Cribo production environment to actually synchronize its configuration with uh, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, only once we do this action, Cribo will be updated, Cribo will be restarted in some cases, and Cribo will push the data to the workers that are part of the production system. Um, this particular step, step five, uh, normally what I've seen done is actually a command line that you have to run. This command line that has to be run on the Cribble production system. And there is a few other options like to do workflows instead of Git. But the point is to do this action, to do this step-by-step, uh, -step, the very first thing you have to do is you have to go to Cribble, and I'll show you how to do it in the demo in a second, is you have to go in and collect the Cribble barrel token. And this barrel token is a required uh, flag by Cribble to do this synchronization. By default, it expires uh, every few hours. And so when, whenever you have to do this um, a synchronization between Cribble a production environment and your production branch in GitHub, GitLab, you will have to collect a new bearer token. And so in this particular example, I have this command curl, I point to the Cribble um, production environment, I then pass in the bearer token that I collected it. And finally, the last two flags is I tell Cribble where uh, to collect the data from from the production um, from the production uh, branch and deploy equals true, which means go and push this data to Cribble and restart Cribble. So that's kind of the five steps that you have to go through to make sure that you have a full uh, production to development type of integration. There is one more thing here, which is just as important, everything that I mentioned that I've done through the UI is also available through the command line. To do this command line, you have to be kind of um, aware of these flags, the Git remote, Cribble Git ops, uh, the ability to point to the authentication, the OSSH, or uh, the Git branch, that's uh, which branch you're gonna go after. Uh, the auth could be either the basic, which is username and password, or SSH, the one I used. And the user, it's whenever you have the basic authentication, you, ne you need to provide a user. And the password, which is basically a token that we add in GitHub. And this example here is what I had to do to avoid Cribble UI to connect Cribble dev environment to GitHub and then my production uh, environment to GitHub. And so what, if you kind of reading it carefully, you can see the Git remote points to my uh, uh, Git repository, the branch here, this is for dev, I told Cribble, go and use the dev branch. The authentication is SSH. The SSH command really points to the private key of, um, uh, for the authentication. The SSH command, a private key is right here, just the location. And then finally, the important piece here is that I told Cribble, because it's dev, and I want Cribble to be able to read and write, basically write, bottom line, to GitHub is to have Git ops equals to none, uh, which is totally different than whenever I set it up on my production. Here, as I showed you earlier in the UI, the Git ops is set to push, which means I told the, uh, the to Cribble production to be a uh, read only. 
So that is, in an essence, what you have to do to take this loop. Um, start from all of your changes are done on the development environment of Cribble. The production, most likely, is going to be read-only, and it will be the one that's collecting the data only after it was approved. Hey, Renan. Um, yes, please. What if you have more of like a dev, then a test, and then a prod in type environment? Can you add more than just two environments to this? Yeah, for sure. Um, but at that point, this part right here it has to be, because at the end of the day, production will read just from one of them. And let's call it uh, whatever. Uh, whatever it is that you want to call that branch, that's where production will get the data from. So let's make sure that is one source of truth. But whatever you do here, up to number four, is totally can be multiple different branches. Thank you. And um, what release was this uh, supported in Logstream? In Logstream, we initially uh, started in 3.2. And the one that I have um, on my demo here, this one right here is actually based on version 3.3.1. Okay. Yeah, before we added support for GitOps inside Logstream, we did have some pretty large customers that work with this type of flow. And they had asked, how can we support that when it wasn't built into the product yet? And so one of our consulting partners, the formerly known as Concanon, now they're Blue Voyant, had instrumented 100% of this into Logstream even before we supported it in our user interface, pretty much identical to the process that you described. And in their environment, they had they had six, I believe, six different branches in Bitbucket. They had a test, a live update, a backup. Uh, and within test and production, they had both a prod test, a prod live, a prod update. And it would, it would go uphill. It would start in the dev, they would go through the process. And behind the scenes though, uh, when you did a commit deploy, uh, they, they required that in the comments of the commit deploy that you referenced the JIRA uh, about why you're requesting these changes so that as it went upstream through the test environment and they would do the PR, they could read the JIRA tickets and, and make decisions uh, and once they uh, prove things within the test environment, then they would push it into a prod test environment, not even the live environment. And then the prod test environment was basically a worker group with a single worker attached in it that they would uh, review that it's actually working properly. You know, they were just very careful. And then after they knew it worked, then they would do the PR and they would, of course, request you know that it gets deployed into the live environment, which just like you described, then the prod server pulls the changes, and it and then the workers pick them up with the the automatic deployment. So, uh, yeah, we pretty much when I validated the process that was done external before we supported this with our dev team, the the developers came back and said, yes, this is pretty much exactly what we do, and it aligns very well with this. The only difference was that there was some automation behind the scenes that was written via scripts that when you would uh, commit and deploy on the dev environment, there was a script running behind the scenes that was monitoring the groups.yaml file for changes against the hash. But it. overall, that's how they knew. Yeah, that's how they knew the changes were happening. That's yeah, but overall, this maps very well to a very large banking customer that I'm working with uh, today, and uh, they're probably going to be very excited. But they they take a while to get through the upgrades, you know, to get to a current release of Logstream that support this. So it might be six months before they get there. But it's super helpful to know that these are the types of things we support today. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so that's one example. I have another customer that is really right now moving from storing the Cribble configuration in S3 to this, um, and then another one that does our sync, uh, again, um, purely t moving to this environment. And the main reason they're doing all of that stuff, thank you, David, this is exactly fantastic, 
is because this integration allows you to go in and set it up in such a way that um, you tell Cribble which branch you want to go to. Uh, it's pretty much 100% automatically set up to, to the whole point of, do you want Cribble to be a read-only or not? And this is just purely none means uh, I can read and write. In this case, uh, it's what I have in my dev environment. And in my production, I have it set up to push in a different branch. But that's really the automation, quote unquote, automation that we allow you to do. And whenever you go into Cribble, and let's just uh, add um, like one route here. I uh, messed it up here, but <laughs> let me just make it uh, not final, sure. Um, and then let's just go into add like a pipeline, uh, add a pipeline, uh, uh, test pipe, save that. Yeah. Whatever it is that we do here, uh, any configuration that we add in this particular case, um, will then be pushed once I'm done with this. Let me just save that. The pipeline has been saved. So the next part right here is to go in. And as we are familiar with, you can uh, do this. In other words, a local commit will be change the, the flag. And then once we push, get push, and if my demo works well, the push was successfully moved from Cribble to my Cribble um, dev environment. And GitHub tells you that dev has a recent pushes uh, less than a minute ago. So you, at this point, once you did your configuration in Cribble and you push the data, you are now in this world, this world of uh, GitHub, Bitbucket. And so you can go and do compare and pull request. You can say who is going to review this data, who is going to be responsible for those uh, changes and so on and so forth. There's a lot of flags here that are totally outside of Cribble, but it's a part of the process that allows you to review, uh, assign uh, external entities to approve all that stuff. And once you're ready, you can uh, create a pull request. And at that point, you do a merge pull request, confirm the merge, and Git basically goes in and tells you everything that happened and everything that was merged. And at some point, it tells you um, the, the, everything was done, everything is happy, everybody's in, in the right state of mind. And, and the, you are merging the data from one branch to another branch. And they just put some sort of uh, uh, comment. and add whatever it is that we want to do. And at some point, you will see the data has been merged. This is kind of the uh, GitHub way of saying everything that you have done in your dev is now in your production uh, branch. So then once you go to Cribble production branch, um, this will be the latest and greatest. And you can see in the pipeline, in the route, and the test pipe that I just added, all this information is now available as far as the configuration. However, in Cribble, at this particular instance, if you look at this production, you still do not see the pipeline we added. You still do not see um, the, the route that we enabled because we have not done the last step, which is the uh, synchronization. And to do the synchronization, as I mentioned in the slide, you have to go and 
the very first thing you have to go in and generate um, the, uh, the the token. And so I usually just go into the UI. It's the easiest thing for me just to click on try it out. I click on execute and Cribble gives me the latest uh, bearer token right here. Let us do control C. Go to my cheat sheet right here and replace what I previously generated with this latest bearer token. Now, once you run this command, if we are all good, Let's see if that works. Two, 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 two. And once, if that works, and it looks like it did, synchronize to true, count to one. In other words, everything ran as expected. So now, in theory, if we go back to our production route, data route, uh, it looks like it's still restarting it. But the point is that at this point, Cribble production now got the latest information from, uh, from a, our Git, uh, basically GitLab um, data. And you can see, I waited a few seconds. Basically, the data was pushed to Cribble from GitHub. Cribble at that point uh, set itself up with the latest configuration, Cribble production. And if we go to pipeline, I'm assuming the, our test pipe with one eval, empty eval, is all there in production, although this one is a read only. So this is kind of an end to end loop that we provide as part of this um, uh, new feature. So there's a lot of configuration or not for role-based access control. Like, how does that all work? Because uh, you kept talking about read-only versus how does that work with our product? So in our product, um, there is a role. Um, let's see if I can. Down to. Roles right there. That was specifically designed. Sorry, I'm in the read-only mode on a production. But you could. Uh, have, uh, and I don't know if you're able to see it, but I'm pointing at it, uh, that allows you to specify who can do this, uh, who can um, enable this feature, and so on and so forth. But bottom line, in this case, what makes this read-only versus not is just this flag right here, the workflow. Uh, once you set it up to, to none, um, well, I have to set it up and restart this. But once you set it up to push, sorry, you are in a read only. Once you set it up to none, you are in read and write. And you have an access control specifically for that one. Thank you. Totally. Pleasure. That's, again, David, that is uh, as of, and, and thank you for bringing it up, that is as of version 3.2 of Cribble. And you're right. I mean, not every customer is aligned with just Git. Uh, one of my customers, for example, they use Bitbucket internal to their on-premises environment, but the cloud team who wants to do this, they don't have access to the internal Bitbucket. So they said, can we construct a flow in our default product with mm -hmm. the current support to work off of S3? The answer is not yet, right. but these are things that we are still gathering requirements around but there isn't anything stopping them. And as the customer said, they do this all the time because of those limitations, not just in you know, our product support today, but they, they built their own. They basically said, yeah, we can handle it. We'll work around it with some code external to this and uh, we can make it work. So- 100%. I, and like, you, like, in the like the example that you talked about for that customer, yeah, I don't see any issues with either using GitHub GitLab, Bitbucket, or your own S3 or anything to do this. The only reason we chose this, the only reason we chose GitHub or, or any of those GitOps 
um, software is truly it gives you like that extra capabilities. It also gives you um, things like you can click on actions in here and you can set an action to really um, set up a, like a, some sort of a, um, the whole approval flow can be done 100% inside of GitHub. And so there is a lot of capabilities that an automation that they created already to enable um, not only versioning, which we leveraged uh, this exact same information with, but also to do push a branch, from branch one to branch two. And like you said, in your customer, in my, my demo, I just have the production and the dev branches, but in your case, it could be multiple ways where production just point to one of them. And another one of my customers that's even uh, more strict is they use no UI whatsoever anywhere to manage mm -hmm. log stream. 100% of the product is managed in YAML files uh -huh. from their code repository. And that's perfectly fine. Wow, nice. But that's all I have, uh, Shane, as far as uh, this particular office hour, um, this new thinking in Cribble land is all about taking the data and really enable this. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Renan. So th there was a question earlier on from Teen, you know, is it the same enterprise license? Um, you know, the answer is yes, obviously. Yes. If you, cost, great, it's the same. A great question, by the way. If you go into uh, Cribble and you try to do it, let me just go to my other Cribble, my dev environment. And if I didn't, I had to go into licensing right here and enable an enterprise license for this feature to work. Right, enterprise license. Yep. Okay, great. So there are a lot of names out here, familiar faces. Uh, any questions? Everybody's on mute right now, but uh, wondering if there's any questions out there from anyone else uh, in the crowd. You gonna unmute everybody or? I'm not going to mute. You can unmute yourself, but just um, just curious if there's uh, any other questions. We'll give it a second here. Um, in in two weeks, uh, we'll have Brendan Delpy. I think that's the sixth, April sixth. Uh, we're going to be talking about designing the leader node for uh, deployment in rehydration repaving environments. So that's something we're starting to see a little more, and thought that would be interesting for everybody. So Brendan will be uh, covering that in a couple of weeks. So I'll have that up uh, on the uh, community calendar soon. Uh, what's the most exciting new source in 3.4.0? Windows event, Windows event forwarder. Not yeah. collector, it's a forwarder. forwarder. Well, not really. Um, <laughs> I know the naming is confusing. Yeah. Uh, Windows event, it's a push model, so we're not actually collecting. It's not a pull model. And we are today, we're currently supporting where you can configure Windows with no agents whatsoever to uh, using mutual TLS to forward the events directly from Windows into Logstream, where we manage the state, which we call a bookmark on the leader, uh, much like you would see with something like Kinesis. And uh, the performance is pretty astounding. I mean, 40,000 events per second, if I recall, on a single worker thread compared. And so basically it was like a 20 fold improvement over what a WEC collector could do. Uh, but with the next release after that, when they add Kerberos, because uh, that's what Windows supports as well, it'll probably be a 75-fold increase in performance on a single worker process even. So it's very fast, works extremely well. I've, I've set it up in our internal labs and in and sending from Windows servers directly to my, it also works with Cribble Cloud. I also made that work as well. So it's uh, it's an exciting new feature for me. And uh, that and Edge, Edge as a new source uh, is fantastic. Edge, Edge is amazing. Everything that uh, I don't think I have, I'm looking at my cloud instance. Yeah, just click so, on your top left for Edge, the little circle. Where are you? All the way up, right there. Click. We've gotten plenty of requests uh, on the Windows the oh, Windows support side, so we are we are looking at that as well. Awesome. Got zero. Um, and Edge is, you know, for those, you know, just the, five seconds spiel on it as far as how amazing it is. This is the same binary as Logstream, runs on Linux. It's a single threaded process. So it's not like Logstream or Stream, I should say now with the new name, right? Gribble Stream, uh, single threaded. 
And it has the same most capabilities as Logstream minus things like REST collection, S3, things like that, because it's running on an endpoint. And the really nice thing about it is, you know, up till this point, we've talked about shared nothing because when you're doing stream processing, every worker process is all on its own, doing its own thing. They don't know about each other. So people say, well, what about aggregation? So with Edge, because it's running on the endpoint, you could technically set up routes and pipelines, aggregation, sampling, suppression, dynamic sampling, and really do true aggregation, true sampling, true suppression on the endpoint, which lowers your egress costs from every endpoint into, and it can be directly through Logstream, which we now have a new Logstream source and a Logstream destination to rectify the license count issue, uh, which does the compression. But an edge node can also send to any number of destinations, just like Logstream can. So feel free to check that out too, if you haven't seen it yet, it's pretty amazing. And so, thank you, David, this is awesome. And but uh, my top two, um, great question. My top two is definitely uh, Open Telemetry, and uh, which has been released not in three four but prior, and I'm still very excited about that. And the uh, WEF. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for for jumping in on that. Uh, any other questions? While we're here, I don't see anything in the chat. Chris uh, loves Edge. Thank you, uh, Chris or Owen. Well, as a source, um, I mean, Edge is more than that. It's kind of this bigger agent. But if, if you were to say my favorite source outside of the Windows event collector slash Windows event forwarder is the exec process. Renan, you want to show that exec process that's available both in Logstreet yep. and Edge? One second. Because we've all been there, right? On a Splunk forwarder, you'd run a scripted input. It would run a process like the Unix TA, right? You're running, you know, so I want you to think that you can schedule an, an exec process to standard out that can run anything, any script, anything. And it can be done on Logstream, the worker, or the edge, where on your sources selecting edge, you simply add top, PS, LSOF, anything you want. The things that would fall outside of system metrics, because Edge already collects container metrics, system metrics, CPU, all of those things. But if you needed something else that's external to those types of metric collection, you could just run a command and the output will just stream into uh, Logstream and beyond uh, in a JSON output. It's quite nice. Perfect. David, this is what you were thinking of as far as... Yes, it uh, is. Yep, perfect. And there's your system metrics right there on the top. And you can see file monitoring as well. And system metrics is very customizable uh, if, if you want to. And, and if you click on system metrics and you open that up, you can see on the left host metrics. And you can say, I want to get everything, or you can customize it. If he gets custom there, you could say, give me you know, basic or like a custom set of system metrics. And you can select that. You can say, I want all the process metrics. You can do that for each one of these things, CPU, memory, network disk, container metrics, uh, and, uh, and more. And more is coming soon. I've gotten a preview of some really cool things that are coming. And then the auto discovery of Edge as well. If you hit cancel here, and you can go to the file monitoring, this is really great because you know file monitoring is built such that you can see the file name allow list and everything. But if he had had an edge node reporting into his cloud container, he can do what's known as teleporting. Like when you click on the blue GUID to get to a specific worker and you could you can literally say, I need to go monitor the slash whatever temp folder for some prefix dot log or something. And you could see all of the, uh, the files that you're gonna potentially monitor from that in a sense, very similar to what like an inputs.conf would be but with full discovery capabilities, including max depth. So it does recursion as well. It's pretty powerful. Feel free to try it, guys. Hey, David. Yes. Uh, it's UBL. Hey, so there's the edge um, node send heartbeats to the leader. Uh, yes. And I'm just curious, like if you have, you know, like say 100,000, 50,000 edge nodes out there distributed, and they're all sending the heartbeats to the leader. It's, uh, is it overwhelming or is there a way we have to tweak and configure or do something or 
So this is what I'd say is our first release of Edge. There are certainly things that everybody thinks about, especially that question. Uh, and we did do some initial testing of about a thousand Edge nodes reporting in. You can change and configure the amount of, you know, the duration and how often it checks in, much like the phone home interval for uh, deploymentclient.com from a Splunk perspective. Uh, and then, you know, the other things that we will address, uh, you know, clearly is the high availability API. Uh, you know, how would I support a global deployment of, of 500,000 agents, in a sense, uh, uh, reporting into a leader node? And those are things that we will address in a future release, including, you know, a UI to support that as well, because yeah. how do you paginate through 100,000 endpoints? So yeah, at this point, like, like, like David said, at this point, it's limited to a certain number because of the, the infrastructure that we have currently set up for this is in memory. So coming soon, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious as to how much we should push it, you know, in the large customer base, right? So I, I think at this point, feedback. You know, we want feedback. We want them to try it out, to start using it. But, you know, we're not, you know, pushing it down anybody's throat, right? It's the exact same binary as Logstream. So when you download Logstream, you yep. can see the Edge UI right away. Okay. And in, in my case, I don't have it, but you can easily add um, an Edge node to start monitoring everything that David said to explore the file system purely as we have the script go ahead and install the product and start collecting metrics and files from that edge. And, and Chris just put a note on that, right? Log discovery is a big thing for him and edge. Um, you know, you, you monitor what you know, uh, and then you, know, you, you also get some of the things maybe you don't know in terms of discovering what's on there. If, if you want, I could share my screen and I could show an edge node reporting in if you like, Renan. That, that's awesome. Yes, please. Sure, let me do that now. Hide all the, the goodness here. <laughs> okay, let's uh, find it. Here we go. Share my screen. Where's the little share option? There it is. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, this is my the lab for our internal solutions engineers and architects. You can see I'm in Edge right here. Uh, I have a default fleet, just like you would figure worker groups, but they're called fleets for the Edge nodes. And this is, I have a single Edge node here, and I can see the view hexagon or list view. And when I select the GUID, I'm now directly teleported into the worker, uh, sorry, the edge node, where you can see your metrics, your CPU, your memory, your network, your disk. And you can explore things. You can see your processes that are running. You can collect you know, more data. You can set up your sources like you saw Renan going through earlier. Here is the difference. When you're in file monitoring in this view, where you wanted to do some you know, discovery of specific files, for an example, you can see you have an auto mode, you have a manual mode, you can set up a search path. So I could do like slash temp and then you know, max depth you know, five or something like that. And, you, and then you can literally just discover things and, and preview and see the resulting files that you're gonna pick up from these different endpoints as well. So it's very powerful and extremely flexible. It's very easy to use. And uh, I just thought I would share that with you. Does that help? That's awesome, David. Thank you. All right. Got to figure out how to stop sharing here one day. There it is. Okay. Any other Thank final you. questions? I think we're good. Appreciate everybody's time this week. We'll see you next time with Brendan and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Renan. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Shane. All right. Bye. Bye.